We're continuing our studies in Chapter 10 on signaling, and in this lesson we want to look at how we can attenuate or limit a signal. First of all, let's establish the fact that we need to be able to do this. In our last lesson, we looked at how the fight or flight response works. Bevo was after us, and we had to increase our heart action. We had to increase dilation of our blood vessels and airways and we also needed to improve our uh, fuel allocation. But at some point Bevo's back in his cage and we need for our heart rate to return to normal, we need our breathing to return to normal and we don't need to burn fuel at the same rate and so we do need to return to that resting state. This is referred to as desensitization. Remember, this is a multi-step process, that is these signaling cascades, and that means an amplified response. So that a small signal, a single ligand binding its receptor, can have a dramatic effect. We'll see more of how this works a little bit later. So the question is, if you start with a small signal and get an amplified response, how are you going to control that when you need things to return to a resting state? Some of this control has to do with the cellular location of the signaling pathway. In other words, if that second messenger has to diffuse over a longer distance, it's going to be a slower signal, and that's going to control the signal to some degree. But we also need mechanisms to turn off the signal. Desensitization allows the cell to adapt and respond to future changes, that is, to return to a resting state. Remember our GTPase or uh, our G protein has intrinsic GTPase activity. In other words, it's going to be the active GTP bound form only for a limited period of time and then we'll hydrolyze that to GDP and get converted to an inactive form. So it has inherently limited that activity. Once we convert that G protein to an inactive form, it can no longer activate adenylate cyclase and we don't make any more of the second messenger. But the problem is we've already elevated the concentration of that second messenger and we need to terminate that signal. And so there are enzymes like phosphodiesterase, as pictured here, that hydrolyze a cyclic AMP. Here's the cyclic AMP structure on the left. As you can see, the, there's a cyclic compound form. There's an internal phosphate bond within that AMP molecule. And phosphodiesterase simply hydrolyzes that bond. And so now we have AMP. It's important to recognize it's cyclic AMP that's our messenger, not AMP. So all we have to do is break that cyclic structure and now we no longer have our second messenger and so it can no longer communicate that message. In the case of kinase cascades, remember that involves multiple steps of phosphorylation, we can take off those phosphoryl groups by the action of other enzymes that are phosphatases. Of course, when the ligand dissociates from the receptor, that's our first message, so we can't even initiate the signal. However, we might want to inactivate that receptor before the ligand dissociates, and we can desensitize a G-protein coupled receptor by phosphorylating it. So we'll add a phosphoryl group to the cytoplasmic domain, and that will stimulate it binding to a protein called arrestin, and that ribbon structure is illustrated here. You can see pretty much all beta strands. The binding of arrestin to the G protein coupled receptor blocks it so it can no longer interact with the G protein. So even though the ligand is bound, it can't start the first process of interacting with that G protein. In our next lesson, we want to look at another signaling pathway that actually generates different second messengers, and we want to see how they compare with the CAMP mediated pathway.